like I thought I knew his core areas, I didn't. What I thought I knew about deer, I didn't. It was tough to hunt him because you couldn't hunt him out of a tree. Like, and you couldn't hunt him, hunt him from a corn pile. You know, I had to hunt him different than I've ever hunted any other deer. I said I had the cops called on me multiple times just from driving around the same area so much, standing on the top of my truck with binoculars. Like, if I tried to go buy trail cameras, I would think this deer was a ghost. Like, you would think he didn't even live in the area. The number of trail cameras I got, pictures I got of him, I could count on my hands. And when it's that deer's time to go, whether it's a year and a half or it's 15 and a half years old, it's, it's time for it to go. Holy fuck, dude, he's huge. He is fucking huge. I literally, like, no fucking shit. I couldn't, I didn't have time to turn my camera on. The doe, no shit was five feet. He was ten. I had to draw at five feet when the doe was at five feet. This story starts back in 2018 with a deer that I found on a new property um, called the Kicker 8. We think he was about three and a half to four and a half years old in 2018. My buddy ended up finding his shed that year. You know, he's not a deer that was on our, our target list anytime soon, but you know, we figured, you know, eventually he would, he would be a good deer. So the next year, uh, 2019, uh, the season of 2019, 2020, the kicker eight comes back in, still not a deer on our target list. He's busted uh, his right side off. He busts his beam halfway in half, but not a big deer, not a deer on my target list. And then, you know, I've made some other buddies in this area. This was a new property that I got. And, uh, you know, I made some friends with some of the other hunters in the area and uh, he was pretty much off limits to, to all of us. None of, you know, we pretty much all, we're on the same page that none of us were gonna shoot him. Uh, we thought he was a four and a half year old deer and you know, we thought you know, in the next couple of years he could, uh, he could definitely blow up, but there were some bigger deer in the area. So that year I was targeting a buck. I called him Cell Tower. He's actually the first deer that I ever got on camera on cell cam. Doe, no matter what, like I put a cell camera out, this is the first deer that was on it. So I called him Cell Tower, plus he had a 26 inch inside spread monster deer. So that was my target deer that year. I harvest cell tower, still getting pictures of, of the kicker eight, but still the next year, he's not on the radar. Uh, the next year, the same area, the kicker eight shows back up. He, he's a good deer. He's got kickers on both sides now. He didn't bust his beam off. Just a good deer, you know, like five and a half year old deer, but you know, wasn't, wasn't on my target list. I had another big deer in the same area, which this is the first time I've ever had two shooters in one spot within two years apart. Usually if I have a shooter in one area, then I won't have a shooter there for a while. But this is this was a really good good area and I had two shooters in one spot. And uh, the shooter, his name was YG and I've had him every year that I had this spot. When I first started getting pictures of him, I called him YG, Young Giant. He was a mainframe six by six at, I think, three and a half years old. So, you know, we watched him for a couple years. He grew a little bit every year, nothing crazy, but he always came to my spot after rut. I never saw him early season, usually the end of November. He, he would start showing up. I had the kicker eight a lot that year. I seen him in front of me a few times, uh, but I was holding off for YG. YG comes in, first picture I got of him that year was November 30th. Uh, I go in that next day and, and harvest YG. So that's two Boone and Crockett deer off one area, two simultaneous years. So crazy area, really good. Um, but the next year, now we're going into the season of 2021. The kicker eight's bigger. He's he's really big this year, but he's still not on my target list. I have a, another deer that I want to hunt. His name is Ed. You know, so Ed shows up. I'm sure some of you have seen the video of Ed. That's the first deer I've ever you know videoed. Videoing's kind of a new thing to me. That's it's not something I, I've always done. I've you know just enjoyed going and bow hunting big whitetail deer and you know it's hard enough to bow hunt a mature whitetail deer let alone try to either take a cameraman with you or take camera gear you know i felt like i've harvested enough mature animals that you know i wanted to add that 
extra challenge in into you know my hunting and so I did you know and uh, it was hard I wasn't able to get the kill shot of Ed on video but I got the shot right after I had some film of him before I wish I'd have been able to get the kill shot but you know just wasn't in the cards you know especially not having a cameraman it's it's tough but I was able to harvest Ed that year 189 inch deer with five drop times just you know a monarch of a buck back to the kicker eight you know he was a giant he was my target for the following year, um, which would have been 2022. I was gonna put all my effort into the kicker eight. And the kicker eight would come to my spot, usually the end of October. He would rut in my spot for a couple weeks. He would leave. He'd come back in December for a couple weeks and then he'd leave and we'd never see him again. We never saw him in the spring in the bean fields. Like this was a deer we didn't know where he went. And I knew a lot of people that hunted around this area and we never could find this deer. Like none of us found his sheds. Like we drove around like all summer, you know, glassing bean fields. We could not find this deer. We had no idea where he went. We just knew he showed up for a couple weeks and then he vanished. Well. Early 2022, I had this deer come by my truck camera, you know, on a, along a, a creek, uh, on a trail that the kicker eight usually traveled. You know, this deer was, you know, about 10 days early from when the kicker eight usually comes in. He had resemblances of the kicker eight, but it was just like one truck camera picture I got of him. I'm like, no, that can't be him because this deer from the year before had lost like 20 or 30 inches of antler and I'm like there's no way that's the kicker eight and I you know I showed my buddy and you know he he's like I don't think it is I don't think it is and so I continued to hunt you know I hunted the kicker eight in this spot without ever even getting a picture of him I just knew that he comes by there well uh, a couple weeks later during a rut the same deer comes by and I turn my camera to video and I get a video of the kicker eight and it's the same deer he walks by and he's he's not an eight point anymore he's a seven point he's still got his kicker he's got big brow tines and you can tell from the video that it's an old mature deer he's got a big body it's for sure the kicker eight like in this deer was probably this time at eight nine and a half year old deer so he's he went downhill i was hoping that he would continue growing and and i was wrong you know he had a either he had an off year or something so at that point it was mid-november and i decided i was gonna wasn't gonna hunt him you know it, it's, i don't know what's the right thing to do but i decided i wasn't gonna hunt him i had no other deer to hunt and i've been hunting the same properties for you know since i was a kid you know i've added a couple properties you know to my permission list but i've had such good deer like my whole life that i've been able to kill good deer on on the properties that I have and um, just adding a few here and there. But, you know, as I've got older, you know, the age class of bucks that I've wanted to kill has increased and the rack size has also increased. So I kind of got stuck like with the properties that I have, just expecting them to produce Boone and Crockett or big old animals every year. And it's just, it's just doesn't happen. So, you know, at that time I probably had eight or nine properties and some of them had big deer on them. I definitely had, you know, 160, 170 class deer on some of my properties, but they were young deer and I, you know, I wasn't gonna, gonna hunt a young deer. So uh, my buddy Lee came up that year and uh, he kind of lit a fire under my ass. I watched him go out and knock on doors and get permission. So. That's what I did. Anyway, I ended up getting about six very good properties that year. So this was last year. I had some big deer on these properties, but nothing that I felt was old enough or that I wanted to hunt. You know, I had some deer that were 160 plus, 170, just nothing that, you know, really interested, interested me. So my buddy that I talk to about every day, he uh, he's like, just go back by my mom's house and put a camera. So. I went back there and uh, when I walked in the woods, I could see some corn piles and some tree stands and some ladder stands and um, I called them back and I just didn't feel right hunting the property. I told them that I see there's some other people hunting the property and um, it's only like a 20 some acre piece of property and you know, I didn't, I didn't want to intrude on, on other hunters that had already been putting in the time. So, you know, I opted out. So I'm like, you know what, I should probably just hunt the kicker eight. Like, He's an old deer, I know he's old. He may not have the biggest rack, but 
you know what, what does that matter? You know, uh, you know, to me, it's about the chase and how hard it is, you know, to hunt a mature white-tailed deer. And uh, the older they get, you know, sometimes the harder they are to kill. So, like, you know what, I have a lot of history with the Kicker 8. He's been through a lot. He's lived a lot. He's going to be a tough deer to kill. Let's, let's go after him. Start going after the Kicker 8. My first sit in. I right, just got in the stand December 23rd. Uh, the coldest day of the year so far. Negative six, negative 30 wind chills, 40 plus mile an hour winds. Just got in the stand. Um, I walked in, I was wearing too many clothes and I sweat my base layer. So when I got up here, I had to shed my base layer because it was, it was wet. So that kind of sucked, but feels good now. We're gonna sit the rest of the night and hopefully get the deer up moving. I just get back from California. I'm out there doing some testing for uh, a race called King of the Hammers, um, which is like the biggest off-road race in the United States. Um, I race for Can-Am and that's uh, our first contracted race of the year. And uh, it's a big race. Probably put almost more effort into this race than we do any other race series combined. So anyway, I was out there testing. I get back. While I was out there, the Kicker 8 shows up on my camera in daylight. So I know he's daylighting. I put up a setup just for him. I know where he likes to go this time of year, but he usually doesn't stay very long. Like he probably is gonna be leaving anytime soon. So I'm like, I need to get in there. So I get home, when I get home, it's like negative 40 wind chill. The wind's blowing at 40, 50 mile an hour. I'm like, you know what? I don't care, I need to get in there. Like the deer are gonna be up, they can't be bedded down. So I get in, um, I see a lot of deer that night. Don't see the kicker eight. I go back out the next day. I have a good feeling he had left that morning early, like right before daylight he had left. So I know he wasn't betting far and he left with another buck, a couple of other bucks. Well, so I'm sitting there, some does start funneling in, the other bucks start funneling in that he was with. So I'm like, oh, he's coming, like, he's gonna come for sure. He never comes and I'm like, man, that's weird. I like really expected him to come that night. I know I didn't bust anything out. My wind was good. My entry was good. Everything was good. I'm like, that's, that's odd. So, you know, I leave, I start driving home and I get a text from the neighbor. I just shot the kicker eight. I'm like, no way. And so I turn around and he already has it out. And I go, go to his house and see it. He, a uh, hundred yards from me, the kicker eight goes to him before me. It's crazy. A deer lives for eight, nine years and he was gonna die within three minutes the same night, no matter what. If Mike wasn't sitting there, I would've killed him. Just to me, that's just crazy. When it's time for an animal to be harvested, they get harvested, no matter what. When it's, it's their time, it's their time. At this point, I'm like, what am I gonna do? Like, you know, I'm not gonna shoot a young buck. I have some 170 inch deer on some other properties. Like I'm not gonna hunt them, I just won't do it. I preach too much about hunting young deer and I'm at a loss. Like, like, do I need to go out and find more properties? Like I didn't know what to do. Well, my buddy that I told you about a little bit ago that I went into his property, um, he gave me permission to hunt and I said there was other people hunting there. Well, they had both tagged out. They had both shot bucks and Ohio's a one buck state. so. They had both shot bucks, but they were still running feed in there and cameras because they were still doe hunting. Well, he sends me a picture of a deer we know now know as metric. He sends me, the deer was in there during the same couple days I was hunting the Kicker 8. Super cold, ground was frozen. He was in there eating the fresh corn that one of my buddies just put in front of his camera. Well, they're like, go, go kill this deer. We're both tagged out. He's like, go, go in there and hunt this deer. It's a, about muzzleloader season. And this woods where this picture was is about 150 acres of timber. And it's probably got 20 different properties in it. Every property in that woods is hunted. There's probably 30 corn piles, 50 stands, ladder stands, ground blinds, you name it, it's in there. Tree forts, I mean, there's freaking Starbucks building the top of oak trees out there. Like it's insane the amount of people that hunt this woods. And I'm like, I can't believe a deer like that even survives in this woods. I'm like, yeah, I'll hunt it. I, you know, appreciate 
you guys allowing me to hunt it. They were just scared that, you know, since they were all tagged out, one of the other hunters in, in that woods was gonna kill it. So I went in there and hunted it. Hunted it for four days straight, nothing. The deer wasn't showing up on the truck camera anymore. And you know, I put my own truck camera in there. He wasn't showing up on my truck camera. He wasn't showing up on their truck camera. So I'm like, you know what? It's getting close to end of season. I've got to start getting ready for King of Hammers. Like, I, I need to get on this deer. So I go back and figure out which way the wind was blowing. After I figure out which way the wind was blowing, I start trying to get permission on properties that were downwind of where these corn piles were. Well, I ended up getting one property. You know, the first property I went to was a pretty good sized farm I got. They allowed me to put truck cameras on it. I put truck cameras on it, nothing. You know, I mean, I had some deer on it, but, but not him. And I'm like, man, I just, there's no way he just disappeared. Like, maybe he's just a ghost deer. Maybe he was rogue, went through there, and, you know, never come back. I, I didn't know. So anyway, um, a week or so later, you know, one of the properties that I just got, I told um, the lady that I'd help manage uh, the deer in the area. The property I have permission on there is about six acres and it butts up to like 20 acres of no hunting, but it's pretty close to a city and it is overpopulated in this woods. Like when I say overpopulated, there are 40 does in a 20 acre woods. Like it is crazy. I told her I'd help manage it. I bought a couple doe tags. So now I have three tags. I have my buck tag, which you know is an either sex tag. And then I bought two doe tags. I go in, I'm only planning on shooting two, two does. Cause there's, there's a buck in the woods that, um, that I'd shoot, you know, he's old, not, not very big, but uh, I know it's an old deer. So the does start funneling in like they always do. I shoot one, they all run away. Five minutes later and they come back in, I shoot another one. You know, I'm picking older mature does to shoot. Five minutes later, they run away, they all come back. And I'm like, you know what? I'm like, I told this lady that I would help thin out the deer and I have one tag left. I'll shoot another doe. So I shot another doe. And while I was sitting there waiting for the third doe to expire, the buck comes in that I would shoot. He's only been there in daylight twice since I put a camera up. He comes in and he, he walks literally right under my tree stand and I can't shoot him because I don't have a tag. I've already shot three does, I only have three tags. And I'm like, what are the odds? What is going on? Who did I piss off this year to, to deserve this? So I'm like, I had to watch him. I just videoed him and watched him and you know, he's an awesome old deer to watch, but man, I'd love to, love to shoot him. Like I said, he's probably 140, 150 inch deer, nothing crazy, he had split G2, good brow tines, like just a good old deer. I left, good thing I did. Four days later, metric. On my trail camera, the second property I got. I'm like, okay, awesome. Now I can hunt metric. Now I know where he's at. So I start trying to locate where he's gonna be during daylight, you know, cause the picture I got was at night. So I take a corn, corn pile in and I usually don't hunt corn piles. I've never shot a deer over a corn pile. I mean, I'm not saying they're bad, but I just feel like anytime you could put a corn pile out and try to hunt over it, you're either gonna make a bad shot on the deer. The deer are always on edge. Like you're gonna get busted. Like, it's just like, I feel like hunting over a corn pile is just asking for trouble. YG and cell tower were the only two deer I've ever shot going to a corn pile. Cause mainly this woods where I hunted YG and cell tower wasn't, it was a little strip of woods that was 17 acres and it was surrounded by huge woods and I, they just wouldn't go through my property. So I had to lure them in with corn, but I wouldn't sit over the corn pile. I'd sit on trails leading to the corn pile, which you know they were fine going to. So I'd got to them before they started checking the corn piles and I'd always sit downwind of you know whatever the corn pile, where the corn pile's at, I try to get downwind of it, which allowed me to get, get two big deer before they got to the corn pile and were on edge. So this was the first time I ever put a corn, a corn pile out for a deer to hunt over. The property where he was on at this time wasn't very big. And uh, so I, I pretty much didn't have an option and it was getting late in the year. There was only a, like another week or so left for me to hunt uh, before I had to start going to King of Hammers. So, Anyway, a couple days later goes by, he shows up um, at the corn pile at like 545. Oh, right here, 548, I lied. Shows up at 548, so I know he's not bedded far. I choose that day to go in. I know which way he left, because I have two trail cameras on it. He left the way that goes to the main CRP bedding. 
So I pretty much knew where he was bedded. And I went in, the wind was perfect. I get in early about noon and I'm sitting there. The deer start funneling into the corn pile. You know, they're all on edge. I have another little buck circling and, he, and he's on edge. He gets a whiff of me. Here comes metric. He's coming in, I, I watch him come in. So I start, I move my camera over, my camera arm in front of me, start videoing him. Metric comes in, I can't really grab my bow yet because this buck, small buck's behind me and he, it's trying to bust me. And uh, Metric makes it all the way to the corn pile, he starts eating. I know this, this buck behind me is gonna bust me. So I'm like, I have a good shot on Metric. So I go ahead and grab my bow. When I grab my bow, the buck behind me blows. So they all look at him. That gives me an opportunity to draw. I draw, I have my camera arm going in front of me with my camera off to the side. And I even check it. I'm like, oh, I'm clear. String's clear. Everything's clear of the camera arm. What I didn't you know, think about was the rotation of the cam. The rotation of the cam, when I lit, lit off, came back, hit the camera arm, exploded my bow, exploded the arrow, vacated the deer out of the area. Metric runs 50 yards and stands there. This deer stands there for 30 minutes, and when I say he doesn't move, he is a statue for 30 minutes. The only thing's moving on this deer is ears. And I sit there and watch him and video him, and I have no bow, no nothing. And I just figured he was gonna keep going. He came back, only deer to come back. He came back to the corn pile and started eating. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And I'm like trying to figure out how I can fix my bow or throw an arrow at him or something. It's like, there's nothing I can do. Like. <laughs> Like, the amount of crap that went through my head at that time was crazy. Anyway, I sit there and watch him, and I just, you know, after the first couple minutes, I'm like, you know what, just sit here and enjoy watching him. Like, there's nothing you can do. You can't harvest this deer right now. Just enjoy the moment. So, you know, I did, and it was, it was actually pretty cool just to sit there and watch him, and then watch him walk away, and it was actually pretty rewarding. You know, after that night, I shot him, or shot, tried to shoot at him, and the bow explodes. He, uh, he leaves out of there and he doesn't come back. Um, he doesn't come back that night. I don't get any more pictures of him that night. Like, you know what? I know which way he headed and he headed towards the property that I first got. So I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna go there. I'm gonna put a corn pile in front of one of my cameras. So I did. I go there and I put a corn pile in front of the camera and I'm like, you know, I'm gonna hunt it. So since my bow blew up, I wasn't really able to get it fixed. I had a broken limb and everything else. So I take my old bow, which I didn't have any arrows for. All right, it's 5 a.m. Couldn't sleep last night. You know, after after my bow blowing up on me. Rookie, freaking hit the camera limb when I went to shoot. I have to get old trusty out, bring the RX-3 out. It's my favorite bow, so better watch out today because that bow's a silent killer. But, but we're balls deep in KOH stuff. Trying to get all the cars ready. I gotta leave next week for KOH, so I'm running out of time here in Ohio. I've been waiting all year for a, a mature buck, and you know, it came down to late season. I found one, and then I lost him. I lost him for three weeks, didn't know where he went. Pretty much went on a freaking wild goose hunt. Finally found him, found his core area. When I sat up on him last night, he came in 4.30, and the bow tells the rest of the story, but I don't know we're gonna give it a shot today. I'm running out of time. So I go in the backyard and practice, and when I'm shooting, like the arrow's dropping like four inches at 40 yards. I'm like, you know what, that's fine. Like my furthest shot's probably gonna be 30, maybe 40 at the most. So if he's at 30, I gotta put my pin at 40. Like no big deal, I've got it figured out. So I shoot for a little bit, go and put this corn pile out, and set right up. So I'm sitting there, it starts getting dark, you know, probably 20 minutes of shooting light left. Um, have deer, you know, in the whole time. The buck that was with him the night before comes in. He's right behind him. Metric's right behind him. Metric comes in, he starts feeding with this other buck and this other buck standing in front of him. I, I don't have a shot. So I'm just sitting there watching him at 30 yards. Um, this other buck's right in front of him. I could, I could clearly see his vitals, but I was scared if I shot, the other buck may lift his head and accidentally hit the other buck. So I waited for the other buck to clear out. Finally got a good shot at metric and I'd already moved my pin to 40 yards because he was at 30. And for some reason when I drew, I'm like, I have to aim high. When I shot, he ducked the arrow and 
I had already adjusted my pin, so I just missed his back. I don't know, I was like, you got to be kidding me. I haven't missed a deer in over a decade. It's definitely my fault for hunting with a bow that was not completely 100% set up. I'll never do that again. You know, I don't want to wound an animal. Like, I got lucky I missed this deer. Like, thank God I missed this deer. I will never hunt again with a piece of equipment that's not set up completely perfect. Um, it's, not, it's not fair to the animal that you're hunting. So I will definitely never do that again. You know, that was my mistake. Anyway, so after that happened, that was my, you know, pretty much the last day I seen him. Uh, I didn't get him on trail camera anymore. Um, we had to go to King of Hammers. So I sent my guys out there. Uh, they took the rig out and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna stay and hunt two more days. So this was getting to the end of season, only a couple days left. I stayed and hunted, nothing. Didn't even, didn't even get him on camera. So I landed Phoenix on my way out to KOH. He shows up. This was like, I don't know the exact date, but there's only a couple days of season left at this point. So at this point, I'm like, should I come home and hunt him? Uh, we are in Johnson Valley, California at King of Hammers, and um, I'll fly home tonight because tomorrow's the last day of bow season, and my deer showed up, and uh, I, don't, I don't even know why I'm here right now. It should be a tree stand. I mean, as what, what time is it now? It is noon here, so it's, yeah, it should be in deer stand. It's three o'clock in Ohio. I'm supposed to be at KOH. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna go to KOH and I'm gonna go home and find this deer sheds. And I knew he made it through season. You know, no one else was really hunting at this time. I was in a sense sad that I didn't get to harvest him this year, but you know, after kind of looking at more of his trail camera pictures and stuff and you know, not really having any history with the deer, I'm like, you know what, this deer could be four and a half. You know, maybe as a you know, maybe it was a godsend I didn't didn't harvest this animal. And you know, like I said before, like when it's an animal's time, it's an animal's time. And it just wasn't his time. Like I haven't missed a deer or not found a deer that I've shot since I was 17 years old. Like, and, and I've shot a deer almost every year since I was 16. It just wasn't meant to be for metric in 2022. But I did find a shed. I found one of his sides. I probably looked for 50 miles, found one of his sides. They gave me a good strategy going in to this year, 2023. So this year, I start looking for metric in the areas he was at last year. Couldn't find him. I've got trail cameras out, I've got corn piles out, I've got 15, I pretty much move all my trail cameras in on metric. Like I'm trying to find this deer, I, I couldn't find him. I have all the other deer on trail camera in velvet, not him. So I'm, I'm driving around, like using my spotting scope, like trying to find this deer. Finally, boom, he's in the field that was just next to where I missed him uh, last year. I'm like, okay, perfect, he's in the area. So I go in, I, I put some cameras up right where I seen him. I was going in to put cameras up. Well, I walk in and I'm walking down the, in between the, the beans and, and uh, this little patch of CRP and I look over and there he is. He's bedded within three feet of me. I look at him, he looks at me. We probably stare at each other for three minutes. I have never seen a deer so scared in his life. When I looked at him and he looked at me, he took off through this brush and I've bumped a lot of deer in my time hunting. I've never seen a deer like look at me with the fear that this deer had. And he took off out of there and the place where, I, the one uh, place that I have permission, one of the kids was standing outside and, and got this video of him right when I ran him out. First vi velvet picture video that I'd got of this deer. Mom, look, look at that big ass deer, look. He gives it to me when I walk out and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I was so scared that this video was gonna go viral and people were gonna try to come and, and hunt this deer and you know it definitely had me worried and I kind of knew that this deer probably wasn't gonna come back to that spot you know I left trail cameras there but like I felt like I scared this deer so bad that he may never come back to that spot I was pretty worried um, and I never got any pictures of him in velvet he wouldn't come to corn piles like 
I, I didn't know where he went after this. I had no idea. I knew which direction he ran, so I ended up getting permission. The direction he ran to when I ran him off, I ended up getting permission there, but I, I never got him there. So I started going out and just driving around. I'd sit up in the evenings, I'd, I'd sit up in a tree and, and I'd just watch these bean fields. Once I figured out where he was at, he spent 80% of his time in one area. But he wouldn't come to corn piles. He wasn't a corn pile deer early and he didn't really like scrapes. I had truck hammers on scrapes and corn piles. He would never go to it. I literally just had to, if it wasn't for groundwork and just driving around, getting cops called on me, I had the cops called on me twice because they just saw my truck like driving around the area so much that they just called the cops. So I had the cops call on me twice. So probably more than that. But you know, after they cops came twice, they're like, we know your truck now, we know what you're doing. So um, any call we get, we'll just, you know, void it. So I just start going out and uh, finding out where this deer's living. And uh, I start getting a lot of footage of him. You know, we get a lot of uh, footage from the road. Like I've got this deer dialed. Like I know where he's living. I know where he goes. If you split this block up into fours, one of the woods or one of the blocks is the big woods where all the hunters are. The other three blocks are not really hunted and it's because there's not much woods there. It's all just big fields and ditch lines. And that's where this deer was living. This deer was living in ditch lines and creek lines. He wouldn't go into the big woods. He wouldn't come to corn piles, which I thought was great. I mean, it, it kind of took him off the table from your traditional hunter that just wanted to hunt woods. And uh, I knew that to hunt this deer, I might not be able to kill him out of a tree stand, um, which I am a tree stand hunter. Um, I've never killed a deer off the ground. I'm sure it, it's tough, you know, to get within bow range of a 200 inch white tail is uh, almost unheard of. Well, he starts showing up on a couple cameras. I start getting a couple pictures of him. I got a couple pictures of him here, but this wasn't in his core area. This was just one of the blocks that he visited. And actually this block, I watched him bed down uh, within 20 yards of construction workers. And he stayed there all day with construction workers within 20, 30 yards of him. And it didn't, you know, he never got up. Like he was still there. When I went back in the afternoon, he didn't care. It's like, it was crazy. It's almost like sometimes these deer, they may like the noise. Of course he had the wind in his advantage, but I thought, you know, all deer wanted to be like in deep woods, like where they could hear everything. Like this, this buck, he lived, he lived right, right out in the middle. You could drive by the majority of the time, especially early season, he'd bed right in the middle of the beans. He was right in the middle of a bean field. You couldn't see him like with the naked eye, but you know, if you would scan the beans with a spotting scope, you would see him. Like his rack was sticking up out of the beans. It was pretty freaking cool. You know, and I'd, I'd get him on trail camera every now and then. I just never got him on a corn pile. So I, I put out mineral on a, on a stump, on a, a trail that he liked to go through. He'd cut through the corner of this woods to get to this little finger. So I put a, uh, um, some mineral on a stump and he would go to it. So that's where I started getting some pictures of him. So I knew when he was in there, cause that was an area I couldn't see from the road. I'd use this trail camera to figure out when and where he was at if he went into this finger. There was this finger off this woods where he liked to bed. He would never bed in the woods. He'd always bed off the woods. The second day of season in the morning, he's bedded in the beans. I see him, but I'm in a tree. So I go home. I get my tripod to put my camera on because all I have is my my tree, uh, whatever the thing that holds the camera on the tree. That's all I have. So I'm like, I want to get this deer on video. Like to me, it's a big deal to get this deer on video. I, you know, that was one of my main goals I set out this year. So I drive home, get my tripod. I go back. He's still in the beans, but he's standing. And I knew where I wanted to cut him off because I knew where he was going. I knew he was going to this bedding where this thick CRP, I knew he was going there. So I knew if I got there before he did, I could cut him off and the wind was in my favor. I was just two minutes too late. He, uh, he beat me to it. If I wouldn't have went back and got my tripod, I'd have killed him that day. So I got with him probably 30 yards of him, wasn't able to get a shot. He goes into his bedding and I, I couldn't hunt him there. 
uh, for one, it was off property that I, I had permission and I was hoping he'd come back out of it. So I, I hunted where I figured he'd come out that night. He never did. He never even, I don't know if he was still in there, but he never got up. I have a couple more encounters with him. I watch him from the truck. I, I'd always go out in the mornings and try to watch him bed. I try to figure out where he bedded. And uh, a lot of mornings I could, I could find him before he bedded. He'd usually bed about 20 minutes after light and he'd always get up. Like I'd always stay there. Like I'd go back at lunch or whatever and I'd just start scanning the field. And when he would bed where I could see him, he would always move midday. Like he never bedded in the same spot. Like he'd get up and sometimes he'd move 15 yards. Sometimes he'd move 150 yards. Knowing that, that helped me the day that I went in to kill him. The day that I went in to kill him, I knew it was gonna be a good day. I went to Bob Evans that morning. My buddy was in town the week before and uh, shot his buck and he had been seeing it. Like it was like, we thought for sure he was gonna kill it opening day. And uh, he was up here all preseason scouting. He goes in opening day, the deer's there, but it doesn't, he's, it's not there till he leaves. And then the deer's gone for 10 days. The deer leaves for 10 days. I tell him like, you know what? We need to go to Bob Evans. What do you do? What we do all preseason? You know, when we started getting pictures of your buck, we were at Bob Evans. So he went to Bob Evans that morning. An hour later, his deer shows up on trail camera. No lie, an hour after he goes to Bob Evans, his deer shows up, he kills it that night. So I'm like, you know what? I need to go to Bob Evans. If you don't back into your spot, he ain't a real truck driver. This is our good luck breakfast. The only way to, to kill deer is to come to Bob Evans first. Good old dirty Bobs. My buddy was in town last week and we didn't go to Bob Evans and he didn't kill deer. We went to Bob Evans that morning, his deer showed up an hour later and he killed it four hours later. So, you're recording now? Yeah. Glad you turned the camera on. You're definitely not gonna go hunting with me because it'll be the first thing you did. Did you get it on film? Yeah. Oh shit, the camera's not turned on. Happens, man. You're fired before you even get to go. You ever missed a shot? It's the uh, worst. The what? You ever missed a shot? No, never. <laughs> so I watched him bed that morning, and I knew we were gonna have a wind switch that day. Midday, we were supposed to have a switch from south to northwest, which was perfect for me to get in and hunt him. I went in at noon. The wind switch was supposed to be at noon. It started switching, but it would blow back south every now and then. And if if it would have blown south while I was sitting there, he'd have busted me. So I. I just sat on the edge there and I waited. I waited for the wind to totally switch. Well, while I was waiting, I see him get up. He gets up out of his bed and he walks a hundred yards south, right to where I was gonna sit. And if I'd have been there, he'd have busted me. If I'd have went in, when I first went in, he would have busted me. The wind would have switched and he'd have busted me, but he knew the, you know, he knew the wind was switching. So he went to that spot because that was better for his nose and his eyes. So. I didn't blame him for doing it, but all it did was made me take, it took me a long time to get in on him. So once he moved, I waited for the wind to totally switch. Once it totally did, it, was, it took like two hours. So I didn't start going into about two. I had about 500 yards to get in on him. I had to walk all the way out and around and I had to walk up the ditch line where he was at. It was raining, it was cold, the wind was blowing. It was perfect time to get in on him. From about two o'clock to four o'clock, it took me that, two hours to make it like 500 yards. You know, the last 100 yards was, probably took the longest. I wanted to get in super quiet. I knew he was in there. Like I didn't wanna, knew this was my time and this area where he was at, I made sure I always stayed out of it because it was an area where no human goes. Like, like there probably hasn't been a human walk where he was at in years. So I knew if I went in there and I walked it, he would start getting on edge in there or maybe not even go back. I knew I had, pretty much one chance to get in and kill this deer. I wanted to make it count. So I got in, I got what I thought was about 50 to 60 yards from where he was bedded, which he was bedded in some super thick stuff. So I knew you know, I couldn't shoot in there. So I had to wait for him to come out and I just was praying that when he came out, he'd come my way. I get all brushed in really good. I'm sitting there, I'm backed up to this, this bush. A couple hours goes by and I hear something in the creek. I turn, I turn my GoPro on, it's on my head and I go to reach for my I have a camera on a tripod next to me. I go to reach for it and I look and there's a doe coming across the beans. She comes across the beans, um, so I didn't want to reach for my camera and, and bust her. So she's walking across the beans. She walks all the way to the ditch line where I thought I heard something in the creek. She turns and starts walking towards me. 
And I'm like, no, she's gonna bust me and I'm not gonna get, you know, she's gonna run metric out of here. And like, there's no way I could hide from her. I'm like, I'm backed up this bush. Like she would definitely have saw me. Next thing I know, I see a rack pop up from behind her. It's metric. And he kind of chases her towards me a little bit. She runs, she gets right in front of me, turns back and looks at him. He grunts at her, puts his head to the ground and is coming straight at me. So right when he's coming straight at me and she turns, I draw and I, I was just reading online like an hour before that about shooting a deer forward. Cause I was like, if he comes, like I may have to shoot him forward. You know, I wanted to see if I did have to shoot him straight on where I had to shoot. Well, pretty much everything I read was like, don't shoot a deer straight on. He's coming straight on, I'm draw back. Finally, I wait for him. He opens up a little bit to follow that doe. I click off 10 feet, he's probably 10 feet from me, right through his shoulder. He runs across the creek, stands there, his face is away for like a good five minutes and he's just standing there. I'm like, I gotta get another arrow in him. So once he turns a little bit, I put another arrow in him. It goes through like his hind quarters, goes all the way up through him and hits the off shoulder. He still runs, he beds down. I'm like, tough, tough animal. These animals are tough. I ended up hitting his heart, exploded his liver and his lung and he still gets back up. He gets back up and tries to head towards the woods. You already know, get the margarita machine. Dude, listen to this. A fucking doe's coming right fucking towards He's behind her. Dude, the doe was three feet from me. He turns and I, I shoot him quartering too, but he's only no more than 10 feet. And it's close to his shoulder. He runs 30 yards. <clears throat> he stops, he stands there for about five minutes. He turns a little bit and I take another shot at 30 yards. Yeah, I hit him far back. He went out with his nose and beat the other just lay down. I was only went another 30 yards after I shot him again. So I don't know if he's dead, but dude, you know, I can't wait to see this GoPro foot footage, dude. I literally like I didn't even have time to turn my camera on. The doe, no shit was five feet. He was ten. I had to draw at five feet when the doe was at five feet. Holy fuck, dude, he's huge. He is fucking huge. Dude, I can do that. 10 feet, he's coming straight towards me. I didn't shoot because I'm sitting here reading. I was reading online about head first shots. And the doe like cuts in a little bit and then he cuts in behind her and it's like quartering to 10 foot right. I, I didn't have another shot. He's going to turn back towards me if I didn't take the shot. But it blew right through his front shoulder. And like I said, he only went 30 yards, stopped. And I've got another one in him after about, you know, yeah, I don't, the second one was probably real far back. I'm on the phone with my buddy. I'm like, he's like, go put another arrow in him. I'm like, so he beds down again. So I start walking towards him. I've got my bow. When I get to him, he's got his head on the ground and uh, like, oh, he's expired. Like his eyes are open. You know, a lot of deer die with their eyes open. So I thought for sure he was expired. So I was just so excited to get my hands on his rack. I go, I, I reach down to grab his rack. I pull his rack off the ground to look at him and he pulls it back from me. And he just lays there with his rack on the ground. And I had to turn and walk away. I, I that moment right then, like about brought me to my knees. Like just the thought of him seeing me as the last thing before he died, like really tore me up for about three or four nights. Like, um, it wasn't good. Like I had such connection with this deer and I, that's the last thing you want to happen. Like it was, uh, it definitely put it, put a, a different perspective. Um, I don't know, it just wasn't, it wasn't good for me. Like I, uh, I kind of held that in for a long time. I didn't tell a whole lot of people um, about it. I had to tell someone a couple days later, I told my girlfriend and one of my friends, but it, uh, that was tough. But anyway, we ended up getting him. Um, you know, my buddy comes, helps me. The buddy that allowed me permission on his property to hunt, come helps me drag it out. And uh, I mean, that, that's pretty much the end of the story, you know, and I'm glad that, you know, we were able to share a story with all of you. Um, I'm glad we were able to get all this footage, these great pictures. 
you know, a deer like this deserves recognition. It would have been sad, you know, for someone just to shoot it and uh, throw it in the basement or something. So he, uh, he was a great deer, a great story. I'm just happy that I was able to share it with you all. You know, hunting to me is, it's just, I can remember all the deer on the wall back here. I can remember every hunt. I can remember how every hunt went down. To me, it's so memorable and like I share the stories with people, but I wanted to start, you know, maybe doing some filming so I could share stories with other people too. Um, you know, maybe people that don't have the same, I don't know, hunting opportunities that I do. Um, I just want to be able to share my story with, with everybody. So hope uh, everybody gets the same feeling from metric that metric gave me. I don't know why I like hunting mature whitetail deer. Like I've had options to go on, you know, elk hunts and this and that. Like I don't want to do it. Like I, it's like, it's not something I want to do. I don't just like killing things. You know, people say it's the challenge, you know, of hunting a mature whitetail deer in their environment, which it is. If it wasn't hard, I wouldn't do it. If it wasn't a challenge, I wouldn't do it. I think it's just something that's built into our DNA. Like, like hunting is just something that's, that's in us that we can't explain. What happened with me in metric was something I never thought would happen and never crossed my mind. And even if it did happen, I didn't think it would affect me the way it did. When it's your time to harvest the deer and when it's that deer's time to go, whether it's a year and a half or it's 15 and a half years old, it's, it's time for it to go. We all have our expiration date. You know, some of us die young, some of us die old. You know, I think there's only one person that knows that date and he's not here on earth. Um, I feel bad leaving him with someone else. I think it's kind of like sending your kids to kindergarten for the first time. You don't know what to do. Like, should I just stay here and, and wait till tomorrow morning when when he's done? You ever seen switched at birth? What if they do that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> he comes back as a six point. <laughs> 